Jazakallah. Now we have the second part of the program, the rebuttal session. May I call upon Pastor Rukni to present his rebuttal for 15 minutes. Pastor Rukni. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Zakir, for your points. Uh, I saw a lot of illogical discussion. Some of the things missed the spirit of the word in many, many different ways. So badly went illogical. It's difficult to even uh, discuss it. But just a few points I'm making, and I'm not commenting on everything. Uh, a few points I'm uh, uh, just uh, bringing about. Uh, because my purpose here is not to win an argument. My purpose here is to present solution for your life from sin, Jesus the crucified. That's my person, even if I lose the argument, okay? That's my purpose here. All right, now, uh, number one is uh, about talking about embarrassing thing in the Bible is this. The Bible is so faithful in the truth. It's like a faithful mirror. If I have ugly face, my mirror will tell me you're ugly. If I have handsome face, my mirror will tell me you are handsome. Bible is like that. That's why it represents both sides of people. It shows the sin and disgrace of people, to what extent people sin against God. At the same time, it shows to what extent people could be pleasing in the sight of God. That's why the Bible is a balanced record of human condition. He will not tell you, St. Paul, a wonderful man, never made mistake. No, he'll show you the faults of St. Paul. You look at other uh, literature, even Islam and other literature, they make a man like God. They show him so perfect, never made a mistake. Only Jesus never sinned, okay? Shows Paul his good points, his bad, he was so bad tempered, I would never want St. Paul to be my senior pastor. You see, he had fights with his pastors. He had fight with uh, Peter, I think, right? About food or something. John, right? And so many other things. I would never like, show you both sides. Uh, many other things. Uh, uh, the, the, the prophet, uh, the servant of God, uh, uh, Joseph, in his secret life, he was uh, uh, practicing divination. He had a cup of divination. He was a wonderful servant of God, but he had a weak point. <laughs> he, he was seeking the, the secrets through divination. It's, it, is, it is not true. So, uh, many, all, oh, so many people, they have their good points, they have their bad points. The Bible shows you that no one is perfect. Shows you the good point and the bad points. Uh, uh, Jesus is the only one who never sinned against God the Father. Even that, when he was a small boy, he disobeyed his parents. But later, he followed them. Uh, they, he, he did not accompany them as it was expected from a young boy, 16 years old or 12 years old. Then when they came back and rebuked him, he followed them. He was learning. He was good. As a man, he was learning. The Bible says in the book of Hebrews, he learned. He learned obedience. That means he was less and he learned. That is the natural Jesus. But as far as sin, he never sinned against God. Okay? So the Bible is a faithful record, good and bad. You, see, you want to see how man can be? Read the Bible. You want to see how wonderful man can be? Read the Bible. A criminal like Paul can be St. Paul. God can make any one of us like that. Uh, uh, this is uh, a, a, a simple, uneducated fisherman can be a leader of the world. Read that in the Bible. You don't need a PhD. You don't need uh, some uh, MSc. You don't need some uh, degree. You read what, what, what John did. An uh, ordinary man without education, he, he lead the whole world. Okay, so in terms of uh, uh, looking at the Bible, second thing, the Bible is full of symbolism also, in many ways. God talks about uh, many things in symbolism, right? That's one thing. Concerning, the, um, uh, concerning that capital R and small r in the dictionary, I have not examined that point, but from Dr. Zaki's words, I, I get it. Uh, uh, resurrection with capital I is given as an example of resurrection, and I think he misunderstood it. He said, resurrection means rising from the dead, comma, an example, resurrection of Jesus from the dead, capital R. That was just an example, this misunderstanding of the sentence. I don't think it is a religious point of view. It's just example. Most dictionaries give you an example with the word. 
So I don't think it's something to do with we Christian take capital R makes it resurrection of Jesus and small r resurrection of something else. I don't think it's like that. It's not that way. It's misunderstanding in that way. Right. Now another point he says crucifying the commandments. But Paul talking particularly not the commandment itself. He's talking about what the commandment has passed judgment on me because I am a sinner. That list of my judgments because of the commandments that's the one that fell on Jesus on the cross. It is not, not crucifying the Bible or crucifying God's word. That is, you, that is meaningless, illogical. You know, the, the, the law is holy and pure. And the law was meant to expose sin, not to heal sin, but to expose sin. But Jesus came to heal sin. Okay? So it is not crucifying the commandments. It's crucifying the curses and the punishment that the commandment spells against me. That list which says, uh, I have to go to hell, you know, that is the one which is crucified with Jesus. It's the curse that was crucified. Jesus received curse on himself. Okay, about Jesus rose from the dead. He, he, the whole Bible, uh, Dr. Zeke is saying that nowhere in the Bible says Jesus rose from the dead. I was so shocked to hear that. Now, I would, I would, I would, it took me just one second to locate it and my pastor located it. You could read it sometime, uh, something in like, uh, example, Matthew 28, verse 6, read a little before, a little after, later. And uh, concerning uh, uh, another one is, uh, you look at Revelation chapter 1, verse 18, Christ through the Spirit, he talks about himself, I was dead, now I am alive. I was dead, now I am alive. There is no philosophy about it. There was a dead man, and now he's a live man. No, nothing, nothing playing in words or some Greek word or something. Very simple. Now, uh, next thing is uh, talking about being confused about whether this one looks like Jesus. There's a lot of mystery about the new body God promised to those who die in Christ. And a little bit revealed about it. Number one, Jesus walked through the walls. The doors were closed, he walked through the walls. That new body is able to overcome the natural things. Uh, number three, that body looks like it's able to hide itself. Uh, see, Jesus walked with two disciples after he rose from the dead. Their eyes was prevented from recognizing him to the way of Emmaus. And then he explained to them the scripture, explained to them the scripture, and then he came to their house, he broke bread, then their eyes opened and said, oh, this is Jesus. Not only Mary Magdalene did not recognize him, there are others who did not recognize him. Till the point he wanted to reveal himself, then they recognized him. It looks like that body had something very special. Uh, is it, it can f change its form and why did why did Jesus show his hand? He wanted to show something special on his hand. There was a there was a hole in his hand. See, I'm the one see look the pierce I'm Jesus see I'm Jesus you, you uh, He showed them his hand. He showed them his side also because the soldier pierced him on his side See, I'm Jesus. I'm not a different one this body having the mark of the cross the mark which I received. It looks like this body, even though it's a new body, but it has a resemblance of the old body. Mystery, we don't know anything about the new body, but we know it is supernatural body. It has a new glory. It's a greater glory. And uh, uh, it, it resembles, it is able to, uh, to, to, you could say that, that that is Brother Rukni, when he in resurrected body. But at, in, in times I can't, you can't recognize me. I can, I, I can just walk through the wall. Uh, uh, I, I, and there are marks in body. I can show you. See, this is my mark. Remember, there was a mark here. See, that is me, Rukni. Something special. That that what Jesus uh, Jesus was trying to say. That second thing concerning the tomb being big. It's very clear that it's in Bible. The tomb belongs to a rich man. A rich man will not go to a cheap small room. He will have a nice, spacious place for his full family. It's not a question. Jesus living inside a tomb. You won't go and live inside a tomb in a Makbaristan. That's not a good place for him. Uh, it is very clearly rich mentioned that the tomb was provided by a rich man and a rich man you expect him to have a nice big tomb for his full family members second thing I just would like to remind you it was the custom from the time of Abraham to bury the dead in a cave not in the dust in some cases people were buried in the dust some papers sometimes they were cremated but mostly people were put in a cave Abraham and his wife Sarah, they were put in a tomb, which is a cave. It was not buried in the dust. So this rich man provided a stone cave fitting for a rich man, big size and all that. Now you may say, why the stone was, uh, was open? The answer very simple, it is very clearly mentioned. The angel of the Lord removed the stone. 
when one of those, uh, I think Mary Magdalene or some other one, came, a, a mighty angel removed the stone and the earth shook and the two soldiers got frightened and fell down like a dead two men. And the angel stalled these two women. You don't be scared. It's not meant for you to be scared. It is only for something. I'm just putting my own words. It is meant for these fellow to be scared, not for you. I have just removed it to show you. Look, he's not in the tomb. See, the tomb is empty. That's what it is. It's the tomb was empty. That was the purpose of removing the stone to confirm to them that his body is not inside. His body is not inside. The, the, the clothes fitting a grave is not fitting for him. The clothes fitting the grave, uh, for the grave, that is a white cloth they wrap the people now, nowadays. At those days, I don't know. It's not suitable for him. Just kept aside. Folded aside. It's written. It's folded aside. So that is concerning the tomb is big. Yeah. Um, uh, okay. The next point is uh, concerning Jonah the prophet. Jesus said, like Jonah was in the, two, in the whale three days and so on. So Jesus did not say, I'm going to be put in the whale's mouth. He did not say, I'm going to be in the whale's mouth and the whale will take me three days in the sea. He did not say that. He said, like his, similar to, as an example of Jonah, I will also be three days in the bottom of the earth. If you want to take it literally, uh, uh, did Jesus go in the, in the, in the, in the whale uh, mouth? No. He was in a cave, in a, in a cave which is uh, considered to be a graveyard, Makwarastan. It was a symbolism. Just like Jonah was three days in the, mouth, in the stomach of a whale, so I will be also buried in a tomb three days. Second thing, it is mentioned in the Bible, on the third day he rose. It doesn't specifically say... Uh, 24 hours and so many minutes and so many say on the third day he rose so whether he rose one hour before one hour, hour it's not mentioned what time he rose just mentioned that they went early and they found already rose there's no specific time mentioned to him and finally I think my time is over finally uh, I don't need the four minutes just finally I want to give you one point I, I just give you one point it is written in the Bible, the privilege of seeing the miracle of Jesus rising from the dead, that means seeing him after he rose, I mean, the other way, is not for everybody. It's only for those who believe, for 500 of them. The 12 and 120 and some, totally approximately 500. The whole Jewish nation, because of their unbelief, unfaithfulness, rejection of God's purposes, they did not have the privilege to see Jesus rising from the dead. They, they did not see Jesus alive after his death. So you too today, don't harden your hearts and go the way of unbelievers because God will reveal himself to you if you go the way of faith. Receive the words by faith, simple faith, pure faith. Receive him as a gift from God. He will reveal himself to you. If you harden yourself, you say this comma is twisted right and that comma is twisted left and then you'll end up like the Jews be rejected. Don't do that. Receive him tonight. Soften your heart, he, you will receive forgiveness of sin and resurrection from the dead at the appointed time. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Rockney. About one minute left. Uh, may I now call upon Dr. Zakir to present his rebuttal for 15 minutes. Alhamdulillah. Was salatu was salam. Al Rasulillah wa ala ali wa sabi ajmain. Amma abad. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وقل جاء الحق وزاك الباطل إن الباطل كان ذهوكا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب شوه لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحلو لقدة من لساني يفقه قولي Respected Pastor Rokmi and he said that I spoke everything illogical as though he's going to give a logical reply to all of them and he did touch on few of the 14 points that I mentioned, a few of them, which I'll reply, inshallah, to each and every, and you be the judge who is illogical, me or the pastor. The pastor said that the definition in the dictionary he hasn't checked, but he agrees that I speak the truth. With the capital R, according to the dictionary, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was risen from the dead. For resurrection, he has to rise. I don't tell pastor to agree with the dictionary, because he may not agree with the dictionary, I may not agree, but he has to agree with the Bible. Saint Paul says that. In 1 Corinthians, chapter number 15, verse number 44, that resurrected bodies are spiritualized. 
Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says in the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 20, verse number 36, that the resurrected bodies, they are angelized, they are spiritualized. Does he believe in Jesus or not? Peace be upon him. So, according to Jesus, peace be upon him, for him to be resurrected, he has to be a spirit, not a live body. And all the 14 points which I mentioned proves that he was alive. He said that nailing to the cross, the law and the commandments. Who said that? Paul. Not I. Paul in Colossians chapter number 2, verse number 14, which went against the teaching of Jesus, Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 19, verse number 16 and 17, who says, keep the law and commandment. I agree with Jesus, peace be upon him. If you want salvation, keep the law and commandment. Paul says, nail it to the cross. And pastor said, all your good deeds are useless. If no crucifixion, Bible is less than two pies. And I proved there was no crucifixion in the Bible. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, did not die. Point number three, he said, I said, show me one verse in the gospel where Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, is mentioned as he is resurrected, not a single. He quoted Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, verse number six, he said, and I'm reading it. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. He is risen. It is not said that he is resurrected. Risen means he's alive. I sleep and I rise. Does it mean I'm resurrected? Does it mean that? The pastor said, he saw a girl. According to him, she was dead. The doctors, he says, according to Jesus, peace be upon she was healed. She comes back to life. Was she resurrected, pastor? No. She was resuscitated. Jesus, peace be upon him, was not resurrected from the dead on the cross. He was resuscitated. Point number four. He says, the Bible says, Jesus, peace be upon him, walks through the wall. Nowhere is it mentioned in the Bible. It's an assumption. It's an assumption. Nowhere it is mentioned in the gospel he walked through. It's an assumption, which we can clarify if you know the background, which time doesn't permit. Jesus wanted to show his hands and feet. Why? To show the holes. Who's saying that? Pastor, not the Bible. Gospel of Luke, chapter number 24, verse number 37 says that, Behold my hands and feet. It is I myself. See my hands and feet. It is I myself, for a spirit has no flesh and bone. He doesn't say, see the mark on the hand, it's of nails. That's what he's saying. That's what Thomas wanted. Thomas wanted to see. In the upper room, he shows to say, I am not the spirit. To prove what? He was not resurrected. Point number six. He says that the tomb was big because it was a rich man's tomb, which I already said in my talk. It was the tomb of a rich and influential Jew, Joseph of Arimathea. I didn't hide that. Point number seven. Why was the stone removed? And the pastor said, the angel removed the stone. I didn't ask who removed the stone. I asked, why was it removed? And the pastor said, to show to the people that Jesus is not there. If I agree with you for sake of argument, to show to the people Jesus peace be upon, was not there, why was it necessary for the binding sheets to be unbound? The question is clubbed together. Stone removed and binding sheets unwound. It was unwound and placed. It is mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter 20, that it was unwound and kept, even Gospel of Mark, chapter number 16, which there's no reply. The only answer is because Jesus Christ peace be upon him, he was alive, and because he was alive, he had to unwind the sheets as well as move the stone. He said, that Jesus did not go into the veil, peace be upon him. Where did I say Jesus goes into the veil? His English was very clear. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 12, verse number 38 to 40, that as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the veil, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, did not say he will be three days and three nights in the belly of the veil. I think you cannot understand the plain English which Jesus said. As Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So where is the question of he going in the belly of the whale? It's plain English. Like Jonah was in the belly of the whale, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. Jonah was alive. 
So Jesus Christ peace be upon him to fulfill the prophecy even he has to be alive. But the Christian says he was dead. So for him to fulfill the prophecy, he has to be alive. The pastor said, time factor. And I do agree that the gospel says he rose on the third day. So he fulfills the prophecy of time factor. And there are other Christian missionaries who when I spoke to, they said, let's see, as pastor said, one day doesn't mean 24 hours. And for sake of argument, you can agree. And there was a missionary who told me that if I go to New York, two o'clock in the afternoon, Monday afternoon, and I leave from New York next day, early in the morning, and if someone asks me, how many days have I stayed in New York? I will say two days. Technically he's wrong, but for sake of understanding, I may agree with him, no problem, two days. Though he did not even spend 24 hours, if he says two days, we can take it, for sake of argument. The Bible says, according to Pastor, and I do agree with him, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, rose on the third day. Part of a day can be taken as a full day. So if I agree with Pastor, don't go into the details, you know, when was he put into the tomb, late in the evening on Friday. If he says early in the evening, I agree, for sake of argument. He says afternoon, I agree. He says, suppose, that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, did not leave the tomb early in the morning on Sunday. He left in the afternoon, I agree. So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was part of the day, take it as a whole. He was Friday, one day, Friday night, Saturday day, Saturday night, Sunday morning. Even if you stretch and give few hours here and there, it comes to three days and two nights. The sign of Jonah doesn't say, as Jonah was three days in the belly of the whale, so shall the son of man be three days in the heart of the earth. It says, as Jonah was three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. How much is it? Three days and two nights. It is not three days and three nights. Whatever gymnastics you try, even if you ask Einstein to help you, you can never prove from the Bible it is three days and three nights. Never. And if a Christian missionary tells me that he goes to New York, two o'clock in the afternoon, leaves next day in the morning, it is two days, I may agree. But if he says, I stayed in New York for two days and two nights, I will tell him he's a liar. He's a big liar. Maximum you can say is two days, as a figure of speech, part of the day is a full day for sake of argument. But he can never say two days and two nights. If he says that, he's lying. And he says, the last point he says, that no one saw Jesus Christ, peace be upon him alive, which I've proved in my talk, and I've given 14 points, which he touched on a few, which I have again clarified, logically, that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was alive. That means, according to St. Paul, according to Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, according to the Oxford Dictionary, according to the Webster Dictionary, he was not crucified, neither was he resurrected. If he is not crucified, no crucifixion, no crucifixion. And in his talk, Pastor said, and he explained very well in the talk about the original sin, and he said that, Every human being, and according to the teachings of the church, every human being is born in sin. Every human child has the taint of the original sin. The original sin which he described, and he rightly says what he described, but the deduction is not logical. He said that Adam and Eve peace be upon them. They disobeyed God, and they ate the forbidden fruit from the forbidden tree. Therefore, Almighty God, he punishes them. And he says that he removes them from paradise. Isn't that enough? It further says, he didn't give the reference, it's Genesis chapter number 3 verse number 16, he says that you man, you shall toil in labor, and you woman, you shall be the desire of the husband, and you shall bear labor pains. Pregnancy is a curse, according to the Bible. After that, the Christians say that every child that is born from the time of Adam, peace be upon him, till the last child born, till the end of the world, is born in sin, I'm asking a question. When Adam peace be upon him, ate the forbidden fruit, did he ask me? Did he ask me before eating? No. He may have asked the pastor, I don't know. He didn't ask me. <laughs> if he didn't ask me, why should I be responsible? Why? Illogical. Is God illogical? No. And they have the system of atonement of sin, that God sent his only begotten son, beloved son, for sacrifice, so that he can sacrifice for the sin. 
Let's see what the Bible has to say about that. They talk about atonement of sin. That Jesus Christ gave his life for the sin of humankind. And it says, and he said, and the Christian missionaries also say, that, you know, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. It's mentioned twice in the Old Testament. Ezekiel chapter number 18, verse number 20. Ezekiel chapter number 18, verse number 4. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. But if you read Ezekiel chapter 18, verse number 20, that's not the end of the verse. It is only the starting of the verse. The complete verse says, the Christian missionary says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. Therefore, every human being is born in sin. Therefore, you have to believe in the crucifixion to get salvation. The complete verse says, Ezekiel chapter 18 verse 20, The soul that sinneth it shall die, but the son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither shall the father bear the iniquity of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him, the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. It continues, next verse, chapter 18 verse 21 of Ezekiel, it continues and says, But if the person turns away from the sin, and he does all that is lawful and right, he shall live, he shall not die. Who says that? Bible, Old Testament, Ezekiel, chapter number 18, verse number 20, 21. You shall not die. If you righteous deed, you shall not die. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says, if you want salvation, keep the laws and commandments. It is Paul who says that if Christ is not risen from the dead, our preaching is vain and your faith is vain. And I've proved that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was not really crucified. And people may ask me that, do Christians have one particular view only about crucifixion? It's a misconception that all the Christians have only one view, that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was really crucified. It's a misconception. Because there are biblical Christian scholars who say that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, did not die on the cross. He was put on the cross, but he was brought down, he was alive. In early Christianity, there are no less than seven sects which believed that instead of Jesus, there was somebody else put on the cross. It's known as the substitutional theory. The early Basilians, they believed in that. The Carpocates, all Christians, they believed in that. The Nazarites, they believed in that. The Corinthians, they believed in that. The Christians, many sects, believe that instead of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, somebody else was put on the cross. If you read the Gospel of Barnabas, Pastor may not agree with that. He was a contemporary of Jesus, peace be upon him, an eyewitness. He says that instead of Jesus, peace be upon him, Judas was put on the cross. If you read the scrolls of Najjah Hamadi, it says Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was not crucified. All Christians. I didn't say these things in my talk because pastor will say, I don't believe in the gospel of Barnabas. I don't believe in the scrolls of Najjah Hamadi. So what does he believe in? He believes in the Bible. So I prove from the Bible that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he was not crucified. And they say that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he died for the sins. Willingly he gave. If you read Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 27, verse number 46, and the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 15, verse number 34, when Jesus was put on the cross, he cried out, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, Oh God, oh God, why has thou forsaken me? Imagine Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, willingly going on the cross and then crying on the cross, Oh God, oh God, why has thou forsaken me? Proving that he did not go willingly on the cross. Why should he cry? And in every Bible you pick up, whether the English Bible, whether the Hebrew Bible, whether you pick up the Marathi Bible or the Urdu Bible, the original Hebrew statement is there, Eli, Eli, Lama Sabakhtani, and then the translation, Oh God, oh God, why has thou forsaken me? To prove that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, did not willingly go on the cross. And I would like to say in the conclusion that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he was not crucifixed, he was crucifixed. And I'd like to give the translation of the verse which I decided in the beginning of my talk from Surah Isra chapter 17, verse 81, which says, Wakul jal haq wa zakil batil. Inna la batil zahuka. When truth is heard like in falsehood, falsehood perishes. For falsehood is by its nature bound to perish. Wa dawana, alhamdulillah, rabbil alamin. Now we would have the third session of today's evening, that is the open question and answer session to derive maximum benefit in the limited time of approximately 50 minutes that we have for the question and answer session, the following rules should be observed. 
your question should be only on the topic was Christ really crucified questions out of the topic will not be entertained kindly state your question briefly and to the point this is not a lecture time for the questioners pastor Rockney and dr. Zakir should answer comprehensively and their answers should not exceed five minutes only one question at a time may be asked for your second question you would have to stand at the back of the queue again and await your second chance four mics have been provided in the auditorium for the questions from the questioners two next to the stage for the gents and two in the rear for the ladies if you wish to ask a question to Pastor Rockney, you may please line up behind the mic which says, question for Pastor Rockney. For example, the question mic on my left next to the stage is for Pastor Rockney for the gents. Similarly, the mic on my right hand side next to the stage is for questions for Dr. Zakir. Similarly, in the ladies section, it's written on the mic, a slip. Written questions on slip papers, which are available from our volunteers in the aisles, would be given secondary preference and only if time permits. Kindly state your name and profession before putting forward your question so that the speakers have an appreciation of your level of question and give an appropriate response. We will allow one question at a time in a clockwise rotation, alternately addressed to each speaker. May we have the first question from the gents on my right for Dr. Zakir. My question is true for Dr. Zakir Naik. Jesus was crucified for the sins of humanity. Can a person bear someone else's sins? Well, that was a question that can a person be crucified for somebody else's sin? And it's a very logical question. Part of it I had covered in the rebuttal and I proved from the Bible that according to the Bible, the book of Ezekiel, chapter number 18, verse number 20 and 21 says that the soul that sinneth, it shall die. But if he turns away from the sin and does righteous deed, he shall not die. And neither can the son bear the iniquity of the father, neither the father can bear the iniquity of the son. Means I cannot be held responsible for my father's sin, neither can my father be held responsible for my sin. A similar message is given in the Quran in several places. If you read in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 164, in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 15. It's mentioned in Surah Fatir, chapter number 35, verse number 17. In Surah Azumur, chapter 39, verse number 7. In several places, it says that no bearer of burden can bear the burdens of another. Same message as Ezekiel, chapter 18, verse number 20. That means sin cannot be inherited. Pastor, in his talk, let me give the example of Abraham, peace be upon him that God asked his son to be sacrificed. And I do agree with the pastor. He wanted to test him. And at the last moment, he puts a lamb. That means almighty God, he's just. He wants to test his messenger. But while testing, he does not want to harm the messenger. He cannot see that the messenger's son dies while testing. And imagine, now we have that the messenger Jesus, peace be upon him, himself is put on the cross for somebody else's sin. It goes against Ezekiel chapter number 18, verse number 20. Sin is not inherited. If Adam, peace be upon him, committed sin, I will not be responsible for the sin he has committed. And like an example, if I give you, there's a master, a rich person. He has many servants. He tells the servant, don't do wrong things, etc. But yet they do wrong things. So he tells them, see, this is my son. I love my son. And he kills that son. And then he says, all you servants who used to rob, who used to cheat, now just believe that I killed my son for your robbing and 
I will give you salvation. I'll give you wages. Does it sound logical? The servants rob, they cheat, they cause loss to the master. Master says, "No worry. Here's my son. I kill him. Don't change your style. Just believe. Just believe that I killed him for your sin, and I'll forgive your sins. I'll give you wages daily." It sounds logical. It's logical. Almighty God putting his own son, and we don't agree with the son. We don't agree with the begotten son. As a righteous person, as a person of God, we agree. He's a messenger of God. In that sense, he's the son of God, but not the begotten son of God. Hope that answers the question. Yes, brother. Paridana. Respected Pastor Henry, in the Bible, Gospel of Mark, chapter 16, verse 17 and 18, it says, and these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name, they shall cast out devil. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not harm them. Now, if this is true, can you drink this poison, a deadly thing? Because according to me, it would surely harm you. But as you are a believer, it should not harm you. Can you prove this to us by drinking it? Anyway, it, if it anything happens, it sh we are not responsible for it. Yeah. See, uh, it is written in context of people serving the Lord. And there are times, uh, like it happened in China and Russia, people were forced to take poison. In that context, not in the context making fun of God, in that context, you will have the power over these kind of things. So not in the you, context of making a believer, fun. If you are a believer, nothing should happen to you. Not just you are a believer, in the context of serving the Lord, and not in the context of making fun of God. So you no, say brother, you are not a Brother, we'll, you have put forward your question. Let the speaker respond okay. in the manner he wants. Your question is over. You can hold your bottle and okay. stand there without speaking. Yes, brother. It is written concerning Christ. If he falls, he will not break his leg. The angels will protect him. Satan wanted him to jump and prove it. He said, no, don't tempt God. I give you the same answer. Don't tempt God. Uh, the next question from the ladies section for Dr. Zakir. Any question? Yes. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Zakir Nayak. Um, my name is Azra, and I would like to ask a question. That question of Jesus, peace be upon him, being crucified or dying, only arises for the sin of humanity, humankind, only arises if he is God. What is the concept of divinity of Christ in Islam and Christianity? This is asked a very good question. I'd just like to comment on the earlier answer that Pastor gave, and I'd like to congratulate him. He said in his talk that Jesus Christ, peace be upon does miracles, and from this your faith increases. And when he came to Bombay, he had a disease like spondylitis, and I know being a doctor, it's a very serious disease. And Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, healed him, and he has a pamphlet on that. Jesus Christ gave life to a girl, he says. Now I think his faith has gone down. He doesn't want to have the poison. Maybe his faith has gone down. If he had believed, he would have had the poison. His faith has gone down, and I congratulate him. He's coming back to his original faith, that is Islam. And <laughs> Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 24, verse number 24, it says, For there shall arise many false Christs and false prophets, and they shall show wonders and miracles. And if it was possible, shall deceive the very elect. Miracle is not the test to prove that you are divine or not that you are a man of God or not, that whether you have faith or not, according to Jesus, peace be upon him. Sister asked a very good question, that what is the concept of divinity of Jesus, peace be upon him, in Islam and Christianity? Again, one verse is sufficient. Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 72, it says, لَقَدْ كَفْرَ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا إِنَّ اللَّهُ هُوَ الْمَسِيُّ بْنُ مَرِيَمَ They are doing kufr, they are blaspheming those who say Jesus, peace be upon him, the son of Mary, is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, وَقَالَ الْمَسِيحِ but said Christ, Ya Bani Israel, O children of Israel, Abdullah, worship Allah, Rabbi wa Rabbakum, who's my Lord and your Lord, in no mishrik billah. And anyone who associates partners with Allah, Fakad haram Allah al jannah, Allah will make jannah haram for him. Wama wa hunnan, walali zalmin ansar, and fire shall be his dwelling place, and he shall have no helpers in the year after. If you associate partners with Allah, if you say Jesus is Allah, jannah is haram for you, no salvation for you. What does Christianity say? As I said, there is not a single unequivocal statement in the complete Bible where Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, himself says, 
that I'm God or where he says worship me. I challenge any Christian, including the pastor, to show any unequivocal statement in the complete Bible where Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, himself says that he's God or where he says worship me. There can be certain statements which can be assumed, but in context, it's clarified. In fact, Jesus says, it's mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 28. My father is greater than I. Gospel of John, chapter number 10, verse number 29. My father is greater than all. Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 12, verse number 28. I cast out devil with the spirit of God. Gospel of Luke, chapter number 11, verse number 20. I cast out devil with the finger of God. Gospel of John, chapter number 5, verse number 30. I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. For I seek not my will, but the will of my father. If anyone who says not my will, but God's will, he's a Muslim. And Jesus Christ, peace be upon the Muslim. Not my will, but the will of Almighty God. He says in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse 24, the words that you hear are not mine, but my father's who has sent me. Gospel of John, chapter number 17, verse number 3. This is life eternal, so that you may believe in Almighty God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. It is mentioned in the book of Acts, chapter number 2, verse number 22, that here, O Israel, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God from amongst you by wonders and miracles which God did by him, and you are witness to it. A man approved of God amongst you by wonders and miracles which God did by him. So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he never claimed divinity. He was one of the mightiest messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Hope that answers the question. Thank you. May we have the next question from the ladies section for Pastor Rockney. If believing in a crucifixion or resurrection is the only way for salvation, and if Jesus died for the sins of humankind, then how will the people who lived before Jesus attain salvation? <laughs> Uh, this is very important topic. It is mentioned uh, in, the, in many parts of the Bible, something which have an answer to this. Um, the cross is central in history. The Christian look behind 2,000 years ago, have faith in Jesus, timeless. They are saved because of their faith in Jesus. The believers before Christ, Abraham and all the famous faithful people, they look forward by faith. They were prophets. They look forward by faith to the times of Jesus, they have faith in him, and therefore they are saved. It is mentioned that when they died because of their faith in Christ of the future, then Jesus, when he died, one of the first things he did, he went down wherever they were kept captives, and he set them free. Because they died in faith, they could not go to heaven, because the price for their sin was not yet paid, but they were kept safe in custody, some spiritual place, and Jesus went down in the deep places and set them free. And when Jesus died on the cross, many saw tombs of holy men of old times open and they walked in Jerusalem. They saw them with their own eyes. Uh, so the, the past tense people look forward for Christ in faith. They were saved by the act of Jesus on the cross. The, Present people, that's myself and many others, look behind and they are, we are saved because of our faith in Jesus. The cross is, effect is timeless. The, the cross is timeless for past humanity, future humanity, present humanity. Thank you. Yes, brother. Yeah, my name and is Faisal Thakur and yes. I'm a student. Yes. In the upper room, Jesus appeared in a form of spirit. Isn't this proof that he died and was resurrected? The brother has posed the question that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he appeared in the form of the spirit in the upper room. Isn't it proof that he died and was resurrected? The verse you're quoting, brother, is from Gospel of Luke, chapter number 24, verse number 37, which I gave in my talk and I described. It says that the disciples were terrified and affrighted. They supposed that he was a spirit. Supposed. They thought he was a spirit. It doesn't say that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was a spirit. And to clarify, the next few verses Jesus says in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verse number 39 and 40, he says, that behold my hands and feet. It's I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit has no flesh and bones. It was a mistake 
on the part of the disciples they thought he was a spirit which was clarified by Jesus peace be upon him that you check see my hands see my feet and you come to know that I am not a spirit so even according to that verse it gives proof that he did not die and he was a life body proving he was not resurrected hope that's it thank you yes brother good evening brother Rukmi I am going to ask you a simple question but it is not from the subject because you have not uh, touched the subject at all to my knowledge you have spoken about I mean many things Bibles and uh, Paul's teaching and everything but you have not talk more than five minutes on the subject so whatever you have spoken I am going to ask the question on that only you said Moses has written five books the five books of Genesis Exodus Leviticus numbers and Deuteronomy these were written by Moses if Moses has written the books how he would have said that no one knows my death over against the death pier and Moses was 120 years. How is it possible? So the person, the, because you know that the Bible is not the original English language written Bible. It is from the Koine Greek and Arabic, Aramaic it may be, Hebrew, Hebrew and Aramaic. It is that. It is a translation. The Bible is a translation. So whatever you have written, you know something you are, you said two angels remove the stone. There you have written angels. In the original Greek, it is a word Zen. Zen you have translated into angels. When it comes to the question of disciples, I mean John's, then you said disciples. No, you are playing with the words. Now you tell me, which version of the Bible is a correct? You have different versions. And what language is the Bible is mentioned? Is, I don't think it is English. Because if I am alive... Thank you, brother. No, no. This you is a put your question, question into no, a very sentences. Question. It's a very I serious question clear. because I have not understood anything from the uh, pastor about the subject. Because he has spoken about the Moses, Jesus, and this and that. No, I, am, I have to ask the question accordingly. You have to re relax the rules, please. <laughs> so this is the question I am I'm going to ask you. What language is in the Bible? Whether it is English or some other language. Suppose you know, if I am alive, I am saying, speaking something like past tense, you have to explain to me what language is that. Hello. Hello. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, brother has asked a very complicated question. No, it's and, a simple uh, question. It's a simple question. And uh, one day we'll go for a chai wala, we'll sit together and discuss it together. Come closer. No, it's, it. it's a simple question. It's a simple question. If a, which version is a true version and what language Moses has spoken? Moses being alive, brother, he says, I brother, was dead. Brother, this and nobody is, knows my tomb. Brother, is this that is... English? Let the audience decide whether his answer is right or wrong or whether he's given the enough answer no, no, or not. No, no. Brother, you cannot be the judge alone. No, I'm not a judge. He let, has let given me, the let answer. Let me, you can, let me appreciate. Let me, brother. Give, no, give me only two minutes. Brother, two you minutes, can explain. He said Bible is the mirror. Bible is the mirror. Brother, listen. listen. Brother, we appreciate your enthusiasm. We appreciate your enthusiasm. But you should understand our rules. I will repeat. Brother, we appreciate your enthusiasm. We appreciate the answer given by Brother Rockney. He has said we'll discuss it with a chai wala. You're welcome. He's, he'll pay for it also. Right, Brother Rockney? Okay, ready. That's it. May we have the next question for Dr. Zakir from the ladies' side? Assalamu alaikum. Uh, brother, what is the concept of Trinity and how is it related to crucifixion? F I X I O N. Yes. Sister posed a very good question that. What is the concept of Trinity and how is it related to crucifixion? F I X I O N. Thank you for clarifying that. That will be difficult for me to answer. Again, Islamic viewpoint and the biblical viewpoint. Quranic viewpoint, biblical viewpoint. Again, Quran gives the answer in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 73. That they are doing kufr. They are blaspheming those who say that God is three in one. That means Trinity. 
And in Surah Nisa chapter 4, verse 171 says, Wala taqulu salasa. Do not say Trinity. This has stopped it. It's better for you. Wala taqulu salasa. The word Trinity is mentioned in the Quran no less than two times. 